its use of anonymity, its use of confidentiality, its use of informed consent, because that is what the eth ethical process is about. The, the point at which conversation in a pub becomes research is, is a difficult sort of line to draw, and so working out how you, how you negotiate that fine line between, on the one hand, a purely informal conversation, on, on the other hand, um, either some sort of, you know, a pilot, you know, idea for future research, and then this is actually now research. How, how will we sort of negotiate those kinds of boundaries is a big, a big deal for, for anyone doing ethnological research. For example, if somebody wants to do some interviews with people and the subject is either controversial or, or you know, you talk with vulnerable people, asking them questions, you have to be sure that they understand where these questions are leading, how you're going to use your, your research data, how you're going to apply the research data, because you might they might come back to you after you publish saying, well, hang on a second, I didn't give my consent for you to use my name or to use the data that I gave you. So, and, and you can't go back on it because it's all out in the public eye already. So it's very difficult to act at that point. And it, it brings not only you in disrepute as a researcher, but also at the university. It is true that numbers formally don't need protection from things that we might do to them. But that doesn't mean that all those theoretical mathematicians and physicists don't have to apply to all the, the integrity side of things. So the things that are coming up for the bulk of uh, people in these departments are things to do with um, plagiarism, whistleblowing type issues, uh, Collegial working, so giving due credit for due work, that sort of that sort of issue is what applies to the bulk of people. Yeah, I think the biggest one that, sh that surprises people who aren't psychologists is deception. Because typically we don't tell people why we're doing the piece of research that they're taking part in. Um, we don't tell them our hypotheses. And the reason we don't do that is because if you tell someone why you're doing something, so you might say, I'm interested in the effects of showing you this piece of paper on your attitudes, then they might either do exactly what they think they're supposed to do, they might say, oh yeah, that's changed my attitude seeing that piece of paper. Alternatively, they might do quite the opposite and react. They might think, well, your hypothesis is rubbish. I can do quite the opposite. So what we do is we tell the participants what's going to happen to them. You'll be asked to do a number of tasks, complete questions about your attitudes towards something, but we would never tell them what the hypothesis is. So it's a mild form of deception, but that kind of can upset non-psychologists because they think, well, you can't, you can't have people do something that they don't know why they're doing it. But actually, that's a really important part. But also, they have to think about the people they work with and the people they are involving in their projects, just to make sure that confidentiality is there, that safety is there, and that whatever they discuss with those people remains confidential. Therefore, we have to be careful that we are researching in an ethical way that we consider all the things that need to be considered when we are thinking about research, when we are writing up research, when we are dealing with human participants.